diamonds are forever Hold one up and then caress it Touch it In the last lecture, we talked all about the fundamental theorem of finitely generated abelian groups. And we particularly focused on the case of finite abelian groups. We saw two different ways to write a finite abelian group as a direct product of cyclic groups. One was in terms of its invariant factor decomposition, and the other was in terms of its elementary divisor decomposition. So just as a review, here's an example from last time. Let's take an abelian group of order 12. What are the possible invariant factors? Well, we want to write this group as z mod n1z cross z mod n2z cross z mod n3z and so on, where each of those nj's is at least 2, and n2 divides n1, and n3 divides n2, and so on. So we saw that uh, for every prime p dividing the order of the group, p has to divide n1 at least as many times as p divides n2, because n2 divides n1. And p divides n2 at least as many times as p divides n3, because n3 divides n2 and so on. So one thing you see from this is that every prime dividing the order of the group has to divide n1. So now let's look at the particular case of order 12. We know that 6 divides n1. So now we're just in a case where we have two possibilities. Either n1 is 12, and you get z mod 12z, or n1 is 6 and n2 is 2, z mod 6z cross z mod 2z. We talked last time about how to go from invariant factors to the elementary divisors of your group. So what are elementary divisors? What's the elementary divisor decomposition? Is The idea is to write G as a product of its CELO P subgroups. So you want to break up the uh, group into its prime power size pieces. So for 12, the only primes dividing it are 2 and 3. So we'll have one group uh, for the 2 parts and one group for the 3 part. And we'll take the direct product of uh, the two of them. So how do you go from invariant factors to the uh, elementary divisor corresponding to p? Well, you look at the invariant factors and you ask, how many times does the prime p divide the first one? How many times does the prime p divide the next one? How many times does the prime p divide the next one? And that gives you a partition. So just keeping track of the number of times p divides each invariant factor. And that allows you to write a direct product of cyclic groups of p power order. So in this case where there's one invariant factor, how many times does 2 divide 12? twice. So we get z mod 2 squared z. And that's it, because there's just one invariant factor. How many times does 3 divide 12? Once, we get z mod 3z. So we have the 2-piece cross the 3-piece. z mod 6z cross z mod 2z. How many times does 2 divide the first invariant factor? Once. How many times does 2 divide the second invariant factor? Once. So we get z mod 2 to the 1z cross z mod 2 to the 1z. How many times does 3 divide the first invariant factor? Once. How many times does 3 divide the second invariant factor? Zero times. So we just get z mod 3 to the 1 z. So in this way, you can see that starting from an invariant factor decomposition, you look for each prime p, how many times does p divide each invariant factor? And that gives you the p piece of the elementary divisor decomposition. OK, so the next thing I want to do is talk about uh, how to go the other way. So sort of what is this correspondence more generally between invariant factors and this elementary divisor decomposition? So this is something we said last time. Let's take the order of G to be a product of P1 to the alpha 1, P2 to the alpha 2, up to PK to the alpha K, where these PIs are distinct primes, and each alpha I is at least one. There is a bijection between the possible invariant factor decomposition, decompositions of G, and then k-tuples of partitions. 
one corresponding to each prime divisor of the order. So lambda P1 is going to be a partition of alpha 1. How many times does P divide the order of the group? P1 divides it alpha 1 times. So as we go through the invariant factors, how many times does P1 divide the first one? How many times does P1 divide the second one? We get this uh, non-increasing sequence that adds up to alpha 1. Same thing, lambda P2 is a partition of alpha 2 up to lambda PK is a partition of alpha K. So just to talk about this correspondence with partitions, let's look at one example. Let's say that the size of G is P to the fourth. What are the partitions of four? There is four by itself. There is three comma one. Three plus one is four, non-increasing order. There is two and two. There is two and one and one. And there is one, 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 one. And each one of these partitions gives a corresponding direct product of groups of P power order. Four corresponds to Z mod P to the four Z. Three, one corresponds to Z mod P cubed Z cross Z mod P Z. Two, two corresponds to Z mod P squared Z cross Z mod P, P squared Z. Two, one, one, Z mod P squared Z cross Z mod P Z cross Z mod P Z. One, 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 one is the elementary abelian group of order P to the fourth. Okay, so I'm gonna pause and race and we'll do one more example where the order of G has more than one prime divisor and we go from the in elementary divisors to the possible invariant factors. We've already seen how to go from invariant factors to the elementary divisor decomposition. Here's a summary. If you have invariant factors n1, n2, up through ns, for each prime p dividing the order of the group, you take vpn1, vpn2, up to vpnt, where vpn1 is the number of times p divides n1, vpn2 is the number of times p divides n2, and so on. Why is this t and not s? Because you stop counting, you stop including, once p no longer divides the invariant factor. So nt is the last invariant factor that p divides. So p doesn't divide nt plus 1 at all. And then how does this give you a direct product of cyclic groups of prime power order? Well, you can just take z mod p to the vpn1 z cross z mod p to the vpn2 z cross 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 p to the vpn t z. So notationally, this looks more confusing than it is. This is just. You take the largest power of P dividing N1. That's your first cyclic group. That's the order. The largest power of P dividing N2. That's your next cyclic group, your next one in this decomposition. So how do you go the other way? Elementary divisors to invariant factors. I want to explain this with an example. Let's take G being order P squared times Q squared, distinct primes P and Q. How do you write down all the possible elementary divisor decompositions? Well, you have a partition for each prime dividing the order of the group. It's, what's it a partition of? The exponent, the largest power of P dividing the order of the group. So here, we need a partition of two for P and a partition of two for Q. There are only two partitions of two, the one that is two itself and the one that is one, one. We'll choose one partition for P, one partition for Q. So there's four possibilities total. Two, 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 one, 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 two, or one, 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 one. That gives an elementary divisor decomposition, each choice of partitions. Z mod P squared Z, because our partition is two. Z mod Q squared Z. The parts of the partition are just telling you the exponents in the powers that you get in the decomposition. Two, one, one. Z mod P squared Z cross 1, 1 for Q means Z mod Q to the 1 Z cross Z mod Q to the 1 Z. 1, 1, 2, Z mod P Z cross Z mod P Z cross Z mod Q squared Z. And 1, 1, 1, 1, Z mod P Z cross Z mod P Z, Z mod Q Z cross Z mod Q Z. OK, how do you get invariant factors? Well, you just match up parts for the partition. N1 is just p to the first part times q to the first part. So here, n1 is p squared q squared. 
What's N2? P to the second part times Q to the second part, where if there is no second part, you just treat that as P to the zero, one. So there is the second invariant factor is one, but if an invariant factor is one, that's saying Z mod one Z, which is trivial and we don't include it. So here, two, one. What's the first invariant factor? P to the two times Q to the one. P squared Q. The second invariant factor, P to the zero is one, Q to the one is what is Q. This case, one, one, two. First invariant factor, P, Q squared. Second invariant factor, P to the one, Q to the zero. One, 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 one. P, Q, P, Q. So what's the point? is to get the invariant factors from the elementary divisors. And one is the product of whatever prime to the lambda one, the first part of the partition corresponding to that prime. And N2 is the product over all of the primes of whatever your prime is, to the second part of the partition corresponding to that prime, and so on. So uh, this is the recipe. You can always go from invariant factors to elementary divisors by looking one prime at a time. How many times does p divide n1? How many times does p divide n2? And so on. Take the corresponding product of p power order cyclic groups. And you can always go from elementary divisors to invariant factors by saying that elementary divisors give you uh, partitions. Or if you just look at the groups, what is the first invariant factor? It's the product of the size of the first uh, part for each of the primes. The second invariant factor is the um, product of the sizes of the second cyclic groups for each of the primes, and so on. You can do the same thing if you have uh, you know, 10 primes dividing your group order or two primes dividing your group order. So this is the kind of thing that once you work through a few examples, uh, and there are some good ones in Dummett and Foot, you'll get the hang of this. And this becomes very mechanical to write down all the isomorphism types of finite abelian groups of order n.